All righty. Welcome everybody to our wonderful, magical evening. Wait, why is it? Is it on my face? Can y'all see my face? I just want to make sure I'm doing this right. Okay, we're good. I'm not one for technology, y'all. This is not who I am. Um, again, thank you for coming and thank you for watching. Uh, just a quick little overview because we're going to have lots of these conversations. Uh, this panel series is something that uh, the creative team um, that I'm a part of at Anna Theater Company, both myself, Taylor Jack Nelson, and Casey Spadafore, have talked about ways to keep our theater alive and keep going. And one of the best ways to do that without risking people's health and coming to see theater is to have important conversations that people can be a part of. So you can think of this as a post-show discussion, you can think of it as whatever, but it's also a way that the other people, especially here in Utah, who don't often get the chance to share things and share the mic can have that opportunity. So without further ado, welcome to the Black and Theater panel. We're so excited to be here. Um, I'll start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Shelby Noel Gist. My pronouns are she, her. I am prom pr predominantly, I guess, a director, and I act, and I also do hair and makeup. Uh, Dorsey, I feel like we should do a roll call. My name is Dorsey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Dorsey Williams. I go by he, him pronouns. And I'm an actor uh, for the stage and film. And I also do scenic design. That's right. me. <laughs> Where are you at? Uh, I am located in Orem. Perfect. Awesome. OK, Alec. Hello, my name is Alec Powell, pronouns he, him. And I work predominantly as a music director, as well as actor and composer. Perfect. And where are you located, Alec? Uh, Sandy, Utah. Lovely. All right. And Erica, Inkichi, what do you want me to, what would be your preferred? I should have asked you this before. Oh, it's okay. Um, Inkichi is my name. Um, I uh, go by she, her. I am a singer, actor, and creative, and any place I hang my hat is home. <laughs> I love Free that. spirit over here. <laughs> yes, I love that. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys again for joining me tonight. I am incredibly excited. I think this is going to be a beautiful conversation and a very productive one as well. Let's jump right in. Um, I don't want to waste too much of y'all's precious time because our time is very precious. Um, first question I want to pose is I know that we're really focused on wanting to create like, you know, the importance of understanding where we need to go in the future, what we need to do first. But I think it's also important that we can put a frame of reference on what's going on in our lives and what has happened in our lives as creators of, you know, what has happened to you in the past or what experiences have you had with directors, stage managers, other actors, hair and makeup people, lighting people, what has happened in your past that you think could have been handled better or that just like shook you or things of that nature. Let's talk about the past so we can talk about moving forward to the future. Who wants to go? I'll go first if uh, anyone doesn't mind. Um, one of the wildest interactions I had ever had, and I'll own up to this, I was a little ashy during a two show day, but um, I had done a show and my ankles were exposed. And after the show, an elderly gentleman came up to me and said, now, do they have to paint you for every show? <gasps> and I, <laughs> I should have been so mad, but it was one, it, it caught me so off guard that I just went, no, this is me. And I think um, in that interaction, it was the first time it was like, oh, there <laughs> might be a little bit of inequality here, but also lack of human decency <laughs> as well. Though. Oh my gosh. Well, that's, yeah, and that's an odd, that's an audience member. That's not even someone on the production team. That's. Oh, I, absolutely. I, in this discussion tonight, I think as responsible as theater creators are, I think we as creators have to inform our audience what is appropriate and what is not and what is to be expected. So, yeah. Yeah, no, well, what I, was the, well, I just want to know, like, what was the, like, was he genuinely, do you generally think that you were painted or was that just a comment like was that yes and 
to be fair, or I guess not to be fair, but this has been something at this particular theater that I had heard a couple times. Another was I had done that popular Disney show with the crab and I was asked if I was flown out from Africa, which is so incorrect because he's Jamaican, but, <laughs> not even um, true. you know, just some genuine ignorance from a place of not knowing. Wow. That's, yeah, I think you're right. As far as we have to go to make sure that we're correct, like giving our audience the impression of what is acceptable, what is not. Also letting the audience know what repercussions will happen when something is inappropriate, what is something is not. That, oh, you, you happened to say something that was incredibly racial and sensitive to one of our cast members, we are gonna go ahead and take those season tickets back. That if you can't conduct yourself in a safe and appropriate way in our audience, then you don't get to be in our audience. Cool. Exactly. That's well, and I, since, and I'll also share an experience that when I was in college, I um, was in a show that I think many, I know Erica has heard the story because Erica and I have been since, I don't know, March, been up in these everything's trying to change things and, and whatever else. Mm -hmm. So Erica's going to hear me just repeat myself a lot. But it was a show in college um, in which we were talking about getting notes from a member of the staff. I happened to be a sophomore, so not very many people knew me or knew my name, to which when they were going around trying to find me in the cast, um, the guy kind of went out and, and he was trying to, he's like, where's that Negro girl? This, <laughs> this white male professor that I had, sorry, we can just go ahead, white male, Mormon, cisgendered, able-bodied, not deaf or blind person, um, called me out in front of the entire cast like that. Um, that was in an educational setting. And when I went up to the other professor who also apologized for his behavior and asked if we should do anything about it, he said he'd take care of it. And as far as my knowledge and other people's knowledge is nothing happened. Nobody said anything. No one, and it wasn't even like, oh, where's the girl with the big hair? Like that wasn't even, like there was no other qualifier besides saying that to me at, a, at 19 years old. Oh, wild, wild, wild. But Erica, Dorsey, any experiences you want to share? I think for me, it's kind of in that same vein of like maybe ignorance or not knowing. Uh, is just like most of the designers I work with, like hair and makeup, usually don't know what to do with like black hair, black skin. And so like it's usually usually it's me brainstorming with them or like me trying to figure out what what they, what looks good for them. And so it's just kind of just like, oh, I remember one time they were trying their best uh, and I give them, they're trying their best and they had a picture of like a famous actor. They had Idris Elba up on like this mirror. I was like, Idris Elba looks pretty good, but me and Idris Elba are very different complexions. Yeah. And so, I was just like, okay, <laughs> I will try to get to the Idris Elba look. But yeah, I think it just comes from like, I don't know, not knowing. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't hang out with a lot of black people, a lot of black actors, so you just don't know. Yeah, the lack of exposure for sure. Yeah. How about you, Erica? Oh, goodness. I mean, to come up with one, I, th I think that's like the thing too is that, I mean, I, I've had something in every show, like everything I've been a part of. I, but at this point, I, um, I kind of just block it out into one thing. And it's mostly just feeling like I'm other or feeling that either feeling like I got cast in something because they needed someone that's diverse or not getting cast in something because I'm diverse. There's always something like, and I, and I think that's, Another thing too, it's like, I can never just, my talent can never speak for itself. It was always like, oh, we well, got cast because of this. Or if I didn't, oh, it's because of this. Like, and having to do, like, I remember an audition I, I got, it was a film audition and it was a voiceover thing. And um, I had recorded a couple of times. I sent it over to my agency and they are saying, oh, well, can you sound, I don't know, a little bit like, sassier you know what I mean and like more urban yeah for sure and at this point like I 
just have to do me. Like there's always gonna, I'm always gonna come across those things that I, I have in shows. But um, I think what sucks is that as a black person, I feel like, like kind of how you felt Shelby or like Alec, like when those things happen, you kind of just have to take it on and like move on or like just deal with it. And, and so, and so it, ju it just becomes another day. So yeah, I had a lot of experiences like that. <laughs> It's, it's, it's hard. And I, I was at a um, Black Solidarity Summit a few years ago, and there's a beautiful speaker, Erica Hart, who um, was taking questions from a crowd. And there was a preschool teacher who was like, how do I teach my Black students? And this was in Montana. So there were like not very many Black people there in the first place. And this, he said, how do I make my few Black preschools feel re resilient or feel like they, they can push past any barrier? And, and Erica Hart asked the question back to them and said, um, well, why do they need to be resilient? And I feel like that's just an attitude that we have adopted. Is like, there's so many people out here who are like, I wanna make black people feel like they can achieve anything and that they, they should never have to feel like they have to, or they should know that they can fight for whatever. And it's like, well, why do we have to fight? What barriers are being put up in our way? And I think we come a lot in that in casting. I think a lot of us actors are used to walking into casting calls and being like, there's a certain demographic for this role. I know I'm probably not going to get a call back. <laughs> um, totally. I, how many auditions have we been at where it's, I go to the hairsprays and the Aida's and the shows where I know that I have a shot at getting cast. Whereas, you know, if I walk into a golden age musical, even though I studied voice classically, I'm going to get looked over. And it's, it, I already know. So why waste our time, but it shouldn't necessarily be like that. <laughs> right. Well, I think yeah. what's hard about that too is that now you're also competing. Like if there's only one black role, you're competing for one role when everyone else like has multiple roles to choose from. So it only becomes more difficult. Oh, totally. I, I have friends who will talk about, so you're going to this show and I'm not going to go to that show. So we're not competing against each other because it, it, it is that coveted, that coveted ethnic track in the show. And I, you know, yeah. it's this performative allyship where it's, you don't need just one person or two people. You can have as many as you see fit or as many fit the show. Mm -hmm. Or another thing though, when you do have the ethnic roles and then they are casted with non-ethnic people. Ooh. So, <laughs> showed up to this audition for no reason. Yay. <laughs> Love that. It's great. Yeah, let's talk about let's talk about that real quick. Just in just in case there are some people here that are unfamiliar with why it is not okay to cast non people of color in roles that are for people of color. That being Aida, Lil Inez, uh, Tichuba from what's that one play that everybody knows that I can't remember? The Crucible. Thank you, Seely from Color Purple. Yes. Why? What? Okay, well, I mean, I'll start it off because I'm already getting my hands involved and I'm already upset. But for those of you who think that things like blackface or brownface or redface or whatever you want to, color face, you want to put out there is, is the fact, well, for many reasons, but number one is when you do a show in blackface, you don't understand that you can put that white person in that role, give them a spray tan, a different color foundation, a wig, whatever it may be. They get to take that off and go home. That is their job. That is their role. And then they go get to go out to the world and experience that. And if you're talking about authenticity on stage, you can't authentically put somebody on stage who hasn't experienced those things and have your theater be real or relatable because they don't know because they don't walk around like we do every day oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so i think i mean maybe that just covers it and we can probably move on but as for many reasons stop doing it i'm gonna call you out i'm gonna send you an email when you do it watch for me also well, I think, uh, you know, Shelby, I think another, uh, like, that's just an actor standpoint or director standpoint, but on the audience standpoint, I remember going to, like, a few plays, because I'm not sure Black people, like, go to a lot of plays or theater, uh, but I don't remember ever seeing any, like, people of color when I went to, like, these big, like, coliseums 
tour or, or big stages for these shows. I only saw like, I guess white kids or like white, like males or like, or beautiful like women. I just, I never saw a black man in a leading role. I never saw a black woman in a leading role. I never really saw an Asian in a, in a leading role. I just only saw just one, one niche person. Yeah. Which, and I mean, I've never, I haven't personally ever been overseas, but I have many friends who have been to study abroad and so on and so forth, but said that that's almost like the exact opposite in other countries, especially in England, that like there's usually at least one person of color that's a part of like the set lead people. Like it's very normalized in other cultures, maybe not so much American westernized culture to have that, but that's just a given in other shows and what happens in other places. People are like, oh, this is weird. Mm -hmm. why why isn't this happening so but in so in regards to all that in our experiences and what we've talked about tell me about ways that you would have you hoped people would have reacted or how they would have apologized for what they had done or what action should have been taken after things have happened to you in theater no that's kind of a big question <laughs> um my wish and hope um, might be similar to yours, uh, Shelby, is there was a, a moment where, a, where we we're at a cast kind of, I don't know, meeting. And we were just talking in the play, we wanted to focus on like heritage and traditions in this play. And so the director thought it'd be like a good idea to, you know. Yeah, I was for that. Ooh, I was <laughs> I uh, thought it'd be really cool to like get everyone's like heritage and understand like where everyone's coming from. Um, and so everyone went. Uh, and as a black person, or yeah, as a black male, I was just thought, what am I going to say? Because uh, everyone's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm Irish, or I'm like, and then I can t trace my lineage to like, I don't know, some tropical like European spot, I don't know. And then I thought I would like sneak out or like be like missed, uh, but no, all eyes fell on me. <laughs> the director's like, so Dorsey, where are your family from? I was like, ah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, and so, you know, if I, I, if I remember Dorsey, if I remember correctly, the director was like, what do you mean you don't know? Like genuinely confused as to why you wouldn't know where your ancestors are from. Yeah. And then yes. you had to explain to her that there was no record because of your heritage. And then like the most awkward chill just spread over the room because as, as I refer to it as, you brought your blackness into the room with you. Right. People don't, that's not like usual for a lot of different like rehearsals is like if it doesn't specifically have to do with the text we're talking about then you have to bring your blackness in the room with you by bringing it up or making it apparent yeah it fun so i i wish that <laughs> that whole situation never happened but i also wish that like someone would have came up to me and said that was kind of awkward i'm so sorry you had to go through that but no one did. I don't, and maybe no one realized it was awkward for me, or maybe no one cared that it was awkward. Um, but it was, and I feel like that's life. That's life for people like us. Right. So in that terms, that teacher should have done their homework. And that teacher should have read a few books about why it's not necessarily the most kosher thing to just bring up ancestry in a room full of people because it can be hard for for some people to talk about yeah but the teacher should have had their had checked their privilege in understanding that question but erica and alec any thoughts i'll go um i think um in the experiences that I've had, it's people validating my experiences after the fact, after there's the big blow up, there's the big, we have the big argument about, you know, this cis het white person can't play this role that's not for them, but they 
are arguing till the cows come home. And I, you know, I, in, in my belief, that's wrong. And we have the argument. And after the fact, well, I agreed with you, but I didn't want to hurt so-and-so's feelings. Well, you hurt my feelings and you also negated, you know, an ex a vantage point that's not your own. And it's, my wish is that I didn't have to do all of the fighting for myself. And I know that we are our own best advocate, but how many people don't have to advocate for themselves day after day, but also come to, you know, what should be a safe place theater where we, you know, it's glorified, pretend, make believe we can be whoever we want to be. So you shouldn't have to validate in such a creative space. Um, something I thought about is a little different. Um, I guess, so even like now, like everyone is kind of like, okay, this is gonna sound really like depressing. Okay. So right now everyone's an ally, right? Black Lives Matter, hashtag Black Lives Matter. I just, I still am at this point where actions speak louder than words. So I just don't buy anything until I feel completely safe with someone. So even saying like someone could have done this, I don't care. Like I, I know I'm a, boss like I, I I can take criticism I can take a racist comment I can take whatever again like that is something like black people are strong that is something that's ingrained in them like you're strong so you can do anything but but really we are strong so at the end of the day I don't need someone to stand up for myself I think it's like it is within your best interest to do something because if not you're a shitty person like it has nothing to do with oh like they're an ally like it's doing something right or doing something wrong, you know? And that's, that's on you. Like I, but at the same time, like I remember the people that do do the right thing and they're on my team. I'm like, yes, you, like, thank you. But yes. everyone else that just kind of sits in silence, I, it's like, okay, like I'm not expecting anything different. And, and that's just kind of the reality. Like that's something that I felt growing up for sure. And even now, like, kind of more so because everybody's like okay yeah like I, I care and like okay well we'll see I guess like I hope you do but at the same time if you don't I have to live my life I have to like I, I can't rely on you but that's just me <laughs> no I I absolutely agree that I yeah I mean I don't I don't take a pot like I'm this sounds also really hard and depressing but I don't take apologies anymore that when you come up to me and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, like I saw that you were struggling, but I'm sorry, I didn't do anything. And it's like, okay, are you, like, I can't, uh, I'm so done absolving people of their sins, like of them being like, I'm sorry that I said this to you. I'm sorry that I did this. You're like, okay, now what? Now what happens? Which it takes us into our next point, which is great, um, which is what experiences have you had here in Utah or abroad? um that have like come to like a full potential of what you would have wanted and i will go ahead and just share a story about my good friend erica here that when i was still figuring out my blackness and coming into my blackness we had a theater class together erica i don't even know if you remember this but it's my favorite memory of you but we were in a script writing class together and in that script writing class we had a lot of different people with a lot of different views on how um the world worked and I happened to be writing a script about um, a member of the civil rights movement um, uh, that I, the, so it was a black piece. And when I did my first edit, I wanted Erica to be in my group to read it because I wanted like more, of, I mean, a more diverse, like experienced person to read it other than just my regular white class, classmates. And when I told the teacher i was like oh hey like i would actually really like erica to be in my group if that's okay because she got signed to a different group and but erica had been asked to be in another person's group to read their script so then she was trying to figure out like oh who am i supposed to be a part of and one of the students one of the male cisgender white man students turn around and looks erica in the face and says well that's quite the privilege you have and without skipping a beat erica turns around and says that's funny coming from a white man and I just <laughs> lost it. I was like, oh, I think in that moment, I just went, oh, it was like so overcome with like, <laughs> I was, I was even, oh man, it was. I like vaguely, 
vaguely remember. I, you'll have to tell me after who that person who I said that to. Oh my so god, so good! It was well. It was just one of those moments that, like, I saw <laughs> you not taking crap from somebody and you not taking anybody's shit, and I was like, okay, I gotta match this woman because you brought out a side of me that I was like, I don't even know, like. Yes, call out the colonizers, call out these people. And it brought more to my education because I knew how to stand up to people after that moment. I wasn't afraid because I seen you do it. So oh that is my experience <laughs> with uh, watching people in my field just not take the crap. If any, if, And I'll stop talking if you guys have some experiences yourself. Oh my gosh. The big question, but... Every day, I don't know. I like that. I will really we'll have to talk about that after. But I don't. I've just never been like scared to say that. I don't know to stand up for myself. I guess in any way. But um. But yeah, it's even like oh yeah. So I was living in New York, and the same thing. Like, if someone's rude, like call them out. Like I'm sorry. Like you're being rude, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, I, yeah, I, I guess, I guess, I mean, it's, it's definitely easier when it's like blatant or if it's funny, that was probably a funny moment. I wasn't like, ah, like it was like, I was making fun of someone, whatever. But, um, but I think it's easier when, when it's really obvious, it's like, uh, I'm sorry, what? The, it's harder when it's really subtle and when it's like, you don't know you're being man manipulated um that's harder but but yeah when it's like abrupt always call someone out for sure mm -hmm. i think the like as far as the topic goes of like experiences you've had in utah that have come out for your potential and things that people have done in order for you to come together is that i was one i was in a class of theater history and literature and that someone had uh, made a comment and the teacher, I don't even remember what it was, but the teacher called them out in front of the whole class and was like, that's not correct. And the student came back and was like, no, I've read studies. And the teacher was like, I have a PhD. And like, rather than doing that thing where we get called on in class to be like, hey, black person in the room, can you talk about this? Can you bring this experience to life for us? Can you humanize this? And it's like, are you gonna pay me? Am I getting paid? No, then no, I cannot. You can ask the teacher who's teaching the class to do that. And yes, thank you, Lisa Hall Hagen, or Lisa, Lisa Hall now. Thank you, Lisa Hall for doing that beautiful piece of work for me. Cause I remember sitting there and being like, oh, I'm off the hook. I don't have to do that. Just do your homework, <laughs> it's not hard. Ooh. But yeah, how about you, Alec? Have you had any experiences where a stage manager, director, fellow cast member were able to step in or make something better or just had human decency and didn't make cause a problem at all? Yeah. Um this a slight turn on the question but um and i'll call this director out by name because it was an amazing experience in this regard but i was doing a production of to kill a mockingbird and playing tom robinson and our director was white and i didn't realize this at the time but he probably gave one of the greatest gifts he could which was to let a black person tell that part of the story in a way that was congruent with the experience and for as much directing happened it was very hands off it was if there's something egregious, I will tweak, but also do you, you know the subtext of this better than I will ever. And it was just one of those moments where I went, that's, that's not, you know, allyship, but a true allyship. It is letting the experience be what it should be. I love that. That's beautiful. I think that happens often too. And I feel like, and we can talk about this more if, if we feel the need to go into this part of the dialogue, but as far as like a uh, theater, yeah, let's talk about this. What are your guys' thoughts on like, cause I, I mean like people are looking for like black content, black theater, black movies, black everything to like understand and you know, be like allies and woke and with the times and whatever. But a lot of people are going to things like To Kill a Mockingbird or things to, um, the Porgy and Bess is like one, I don't know what show. 
uh, or ragtime. That's what I meant. Ragtime. Or people going to ragtime where like we're looking at stories of like black struggle, but we're not looking at stories of black progression. Do you guys see do you guys see that happening often? Do you think do you have any opinions on that? Yes. Um I think it's especially in the community we live in in Utah, it's a lot easier to see black struggle when it has a nice cute bow attached to the top of it. If this black person is unassuming and looks like they fit the model mold of what a black person looks like, then it's all fine. But we don't, we don't see the stories of progression because it doesn't fit the current narrative that theater is trying to make it out to be. Very true. Um, I just wanted to say like, um, all the world's a stage, so it's like a double like inception there like i i understand like okay there are too many shows being produced where there's black struggle and but at the same time the shows that i think about the black shows i think about it's there's struggle involved in the storyline there's racial division there's like there's something in it that that signifies like oh the the oppressed you know and and so i think this is a bigger question of how can we show stories? How, how can more playwrights write success stories? How can we, as people, look to the future? And I think like, even regarding like Afrofuturism has been something that I've kind of been more interested in just because it gives black people a foundation where, where are the possibilities here? You know, like what, what, what does the world look like without this racial divide or racial tension? What, like, what can we see? What can we envision? Because guess what? Like, it's, it's really what you can come up. It's not, it's not a history thing. It's like what you can come up. And so that's, that's something, what, what does the future hold for black people? And a way to do that is by kind of breaking up the past and kind of looking towards the future and rather than like okay let's go back and retell the story you know and i love a lot of these shows but how many times do we have to do a show and what's the message what's the theme now like what are we getting out of it what is anyone getting out of doing the same show about this problem and this you know like i'm just looking forward to things where i can look at a script and be like yeah that fits me it doesn't mention race once, or if it does, it's in a positive light, but it's not, the whole premise isn't about, and they were mad at each other because of the color of their skin, you know? It's just, it's just been done so many times. And the question for me is, why do we need to keep on doing this? What are we doing? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a very fair um, statement. And I was recently on a, um, I wouldn't say, I don't know if a conference call, whatever it is, with um, other um, Black Utah high school alumni um, for the Utah Theater Teachers Association. And we were taking a QA and a and they were asking us, like, how do we celebrate Black performance and Black playwrights and Black actors and whatever else when we don't have any Black children in the room? And someone brought up a beautiful, a beautiful point of, like, we'll watch, there, like, you have the internet at your fingertips that like there's so much out there for you to be able to experience that yeah afrofuturism was not familiar with that vocab term but you better believe i'm gonna look it up tonight and buy a book like i love love that and i think that's what i've been looking for and to have conversation like this of course is important which is why we're broadcasting it and putting it out in the world but that there's so much there is so much out there more than just poor game best the color purple raisin in the sun like fences you name it there's more than just those black struggles to black identity as well and i think a lot of white people forget that the black identity is so much more than strength and struggle <sighs> so much more and it's and it's hard sometimes because people are like you're so strong and brave and i'm like yeah but i'm delicate okay like i am also allowed to be soft too i am i am allowed to be soft i don't have to be 100 percent aggressive going hard all the time i'm allowed to experience the human gamut of emotions and some people i don't think expect that because we have lots of other archetypal characters who don't experience that I, 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 that way go ahead Alec. 
I think uh, you're hitting the nail right on the head. We have so many tropes that black people are pigeonholed into in the, not even just the writing, but in portrayals of performances where it's, we are, a, you know, Africa is probably one of, not probably, is one of the most deep, diverse continents, which, you know, we come from. So we are just as diverse as the motherland. Why are we telling stories that are only such a small gamut of and why, why must the black person always be loud, aggressive, sassy, angry when it's, you know, we're people too and can feel every single human emotion. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah, I think it's, I, and whenever I talk to people about this, of like black people, like black people should be allowed to be weird. And I think, I know there's like a campaign or slogan out there. I think it's something, I think it's called protect uh, black nerds, I think is what it's called. But just the idea that like black people have to be like cool and calm and professional, but like we can't be nerds or weird about it. And I think of types like Winston from New Girl and and that idea of him being like obsessed with a cat. And like, he's just a strange kind of a person, but that's who I, that's a black character that I've related to a lot in my life. Um, but I also like, before we go any further, also like recognizing, cause I remember I was in a theater history class as well. I think I took a million different theater history classes cause I failed one too many when I was in school, but then I took a few classes and in it, I remember they were like, oh yeah, in an African theater, they like had some theater, like some performative stuff, but then like they got colonized, so there was no more theater. And then we moved on to like whatever other region of the world, and I was like, that, that doesn't seem right. And then I did my own research and actually did a lecture for a different teacher for um, a different section of theater. And I found so many different resources on how African theater worked and how it was done throughout colonization. It was just changed over time due to colonization. And we have to talk about storytelling and what roots of storytelling are to Africa, what roots of storytelling to indigenous people, what they are all over the world. And that we as African-Americans, black, African, whatever you might identify as, are doing theater in a form that has been created by a colonized art architecture. I don't know what the word I want is there, but the idea that like, memorizing words on a page and standing in front of somebody and somebody telling you how to move is very different than different origins in the world. And I was talking to somebody about this the other day, my good friend Courtney Dilmore, if you're watching, hi Courtney Dilmore, just that like the origins of storytelling have act like originated so long ago and have been changed and formatted to white expectations since. And so understanding that as directors, producers, so on and so forth, that when you're especially doing uh, shows that are about Afrofuturism or even African-American struggle or whatever it may be, understand that like you having six African-Americans sitting in front of you, especially if you're white and saying like, okay, we'll try the line this way, might not be the same approach as what our bones are telling us, which like sounds kind of really like spiritual or whatever, but like, those stories like Alex was talking about has have a completely different experience when we're allowed to take charge of those. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm rambling. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, You're not, so I'm assuming. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question, um, which is, what do you want to see change in theater in Utah, nationwide, and globally? What would you like to see come to fruition. Um, for one, I would really like lighting designers to start thinking about lighting black people. <laughs> like, I really, oh, the but then I to have a more accurate color. Yes, the amount of times I've been on the stage and they shine that light on me and I'm like, oh, please tell me this ain't the final color because we're in tech and I understand that things are gonna change, but I look like, a brown paper bag. This is not doing me any favors. I don't think this is what your concept is trying to achieve. That would be my one thing is that lighting design, well, not my one thing, but my number one thing would be that lighting <laughs> designers, when you're, when you're doing your stuff, please, please, I know you've got like nine people who are white and like two people who are black and they're, one's mixed and one's dark skin. Just, just like keep a special eye. Just keep an eye on what they look like as well. Um, but Darcy, what about you? What do you want to see change? Oh, wow. I just want, we kind of talked about it before, but I just want to see the narrative of like a black person play a 
Disney Prince or like, you know, Into the Woods is like one of my favorite musicals, which is kind of a weird musical, but <laughs> I just, I like it. I like the songs and I just, I want to see one of those princes or both those princes be a person of color. I feel like that would be such a cool thing because I never saw that as a kid. I see Tyler Perry's, you know, um, Medea shows and theater things like that, which he does a great job. If you haven't seen Tyler Perry, go out and <laughs> watch his stuff. But like, I don't see that all. I want to see more. I want to see more black people, people of color in major roles so that I can feel inspired. I can, and that that narrative progresses to other things where they see they see us as like romantic, more romantic leads, more like heroes, more, more different things. It's just, I want to see the narrative pushed more. And we're kind of going that way, just a little more faster. Yeah. And I think I'll add to that too, Dorsey, that like when I, I went to DC for the first time, um, a few, uh, uh, like almost a year ago now. And, um, I saw a production of Into, Wo Into the Woods where more than half the cast were people of color. Changed my life. And I was like, why don't we have this in Utah? Why can't I find this in Utah? We have the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but and we know why. But yes, I absolutely hear you on that one. I would love to see more shows like that. Um, what about you, Alec? Mine is along the same lines as Dorsey. I, um, was thinking as I was driving home today, what was the first time I felt represented either on stage or screen? And it was the 97 Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella with my homegirl, Brandy and Whitney Houston. And you know, how, conversely, uh, to those who aren't part of the black community, when was the first time you felt represented? Because I, I feel like it happened way earlier than that. I mean, I was already in elementary school and you know, didn't have that same experience. And that, that was the impetus for me to want to be creative, to want to, you know, essentially be magical. My hope and goal is that we start, you know, little black girls can be Cinderella. There's nothing that says they can't, and they should be able to feel just as magical putting on those glass slippers. And I know this sounds so <laughs> hokey and uh, romanticizing, you know, a really serious issue, but um, part of that is we we go to theater to see fa different facets of ourselves in the shows we watch, and if you if I can't see myself because either lack of representation or lack of honest discourse about that, then it puts people off of theater. I was um, not to air dirty laundries. I was in another uh, meeting with uh, some uh, creatives talking about a different theater in the state, and one of the one of the big stumbling blocks was this theater is afraid that their audiences won't see themselves in the show, which the retort was, well, wait a second. I've, you know, worked for this theater for a while and I would love myself in those shows that I'm currently in, but I, you know, I have to be that person for someone else. And I think that's why we keep up the good fight, but it also, it shouldn't have to be that hard. <laughs> Agreed. And also, like, if Black people are supposed to relate to a white Hamlet, then you can re relate to a, a Black Cinderella. Like, there's, like, that's not fair. For that That's not fair to anybody to be able to say, like, well, we can't relate to the experience. And it's like, well, we're not asking you to, to pretend like you are the experience, but it's not fair that we're supposed to sit down and watch, I don't know, I was some really moving the notebook I don't know and feel sad like it's not like oh well they're white so I'm not upset because I can't relate to that that's not something like you like yeah. it's a huge experience that we're supposed to understand oh my yeah um yeah I guess just I'm excited to see things being interesting and less predictable like I want to see a role, like, I want to see, like, not just a black syndrome, because then it's like, oh, because then, yeah, it's like, oh, well, she got cast because, you know, whatever. Like, it, she's also fat, and she also, like, has a bald head, and she, you know, like, just kind of going against the usual, like, typecasting things would be cool and interesting. 
Yeah, breaking those archetypes of, of white assimilation as well. Yeah. Stop asking, me to, stop asking me to straighten my hair and then curl it to be in your <laughs> show. That doesn't... <laughs> I'm so, what bothers me to no extent. Um, another question I have that I know I didn't send you guys previous to, but I feel like because it's um, uh, it happened recently, I would love to share it um, and talk about it a little bit. But just um, since Chadwick Boseman's passing and how, I don't know if it has affected you. Some of you are like, I don't know. I don't know Prince of Chala. I don't know him. But like, if for some of you who do, I know I have I even cried today like it's it hit me it's hit me really really hard um if you guys have any thoughts on what Chadwick Boseman has done for not only the film industry but for our community um are you did you take it personally has it been hard have you just kind of like let it roll off your shoulders yes I mean for me yeah I I remember I mean it's, it's, I feel like this is gonna be like a black thing for a little bit uh as time goes on, like, where were you when Chadwick Boseman, you found out Chadwick Boseman passed away. Um, and I was at work and I get like these CNN like updates. Uh, and I looked at my phone and I was kind of shocked to see Chadwick's name on there. And I was like, okay. And I keep reading and he, I find out he's died. Uh, and, I, and I felt like, Move. I felt, I don't know how to best describe it, moved to almost tears. And I don't know him personally. It's not like I had dinner with him or met him or got his autograph or anything like that. But I've seen his, his work. I've seen, um, I felt his, like, his spirit in those, like, in those roles. Uh, Black Panther being, like, a great movie. Not just, like, it was all, all Black and it was all, like, Marvel and all great. It's like a great story. And to have someone who was like a champion, really a champion of for the black community for for everyone. He wanted everyone to feel good and feel respected and feel like they they mattered. Um that moved me. Uh and so when I found out last night, I was like, I didn't cry, but I could feel myself getting like worked up to tears. Alec or um, Erica, any thoughts? I'm not super tied to movies, just uh, Nature of the Beast. But what I will say is, you know, anyone who's had such a profound effect on a community that uh, their th the loss of them is this great amongst, you know, everyone, that, that says something. And I am a strong believer of the loss of one Black creative is devastating to uh, the black creatives as a whole. I mean, there's not, in comparison, there's not a lot of us. And so to have someone who's done so much and has really had a platform to, you know, show what black people can do, um, that loss is pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. I think also like Kobe Bryant passing as well this year. I think, um, I think, yeah, that definitely does affect the black community, but I think just knowing how uh, something that's been really interesting and like kind of inspiring is that like how close the community is. And when those things happen, um, everybody kind of coming together has been nice. And seeing people like pay tribute and um, talk about what moved them and how that person was significant in their life was something that um, was just cool to be a part of. Yeah. I, uh, I obviously have taken the news quite hard. Um, personally, I, cause I, yeah, I came to Chala, like all Black Panther, like, yes, that's amazing. I actually first, like connected with Chazik Boseman in the movie 42, um, the movie about Jackie Robinson, the first um, uh, professional um, uh, baseball, National Baseball League. And I remember I went and saw the movie with my family and like I grew up in it like, 
here in Utah, where we grew up around my mother's family, which is white, my dad's family is on the East Coast of North Carolina and in other states, so I didn't really get to see them a lot. But I remember we went to see this movie with my dad, and in the movie, um, there's an experience where Jackie Robbins is up at the plate. He's playing and someone just keeps calling him the n-word over and over and over and over again and he eventually goes into the dugout area which transitioned to locker room away from everybody and just starts sobbing and crying and I was like whoa this is really intense and I remember looking over at my black father and seeing him in tears and then my dad does not cry and seeing him cry I was like okay and that's part of me being mixed and me being a light skinned person being able to understand the struggles of someone who is much darker skinned because yeah I haven't called like the n-word like a handful of times in my life, but it's nothing compared to my dark skinned brothers and sisters. And so to be able to see that reaction in my father brought me understanding of like, okay, there is a much larger struggle here that I need to learn and like understand. And then other movies came out. I can't remember the movie, he's an incredible singer um, that he did. And then Black Panther came out and, I was, and then all of the Avengers and everything else. And I just fell in love with him and, and his career and meant a lot. So it was hard to see him go. But yeah, I think Erica brings up the point. Like, even like when Kobe Bryant passed, I was like, whoa, that's hard. But I don't, I'm not much of a basketball person. So I was like, yeah, we lost a large figure of the black community. And then Chadwick came and I was like, okay, now I understand what other people were feeling and how. But yeah, I think as a black community, it's brought us together. And I posted on Instagram earlier today that said, if you, you don't say Wakanda forever, if you can't say Black Lives Matter. And if you think that the two aren't mutually exclusive, I don't know what movie you were watching, but the whole, the whole like climax of the movie was talking about what we're going to do as a, as the whole world about black struggle and about rep reparations for black people and like all of these other things. So thank you for indulging in that, um, quick pop-up, uh, question, but um, I think the last thing that I think I want to hit on, because I think it's very prevalent to wake up our other white um, allies slash members of the theater community is what does it mean to you to be um, like labeled as uh, hard to work with when it comes to shutting people out when they say something racist or when someone tries to touch your hair in a rehearsal room or like whatever that means, like the fear of being called um, hard to work with. Do you know what I mean? Do you, does that make sense? Mm, actually, can you repeat it? I don't know if I understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, just the idea that like when you walk into a rehearsal room and someone says something or does something and you're, you can either like, re, like retaliate and be like, don't say that. But if you do, the the fear of being called, oh, well, I, or, or someone else being like, oh, I was in a rehearsal with that person and someone tried to touch her hair once and she like freaked out. She's really hard to work with and being labeled hard to work with. No, I, it's never been something that crossed my mind, honestly. I, if it's something like, if, if that's the context of it, no, that doesn't make me hard to work with. And if it does, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. Gotcha. Um, Alex, Jersey, what about you guys? I'm with Inkachi on this. I, you know, if, if I'm labeled hard to work with because I'm standing up for myself, that's not on me. If I, if, you know, if, if there are people who don't like that, I, for whatever reason, anything. Have feelings. Exactly. <laughs> or if when someone says, hey, will you riff for me? And I go, no, no, I won't. And they get offended. That's not on my, like, that's, I go to bed fine at night. Dorothy? I don't, yeah, I feel like maybe I'm in the same boat. I, I, I'm trying to think if there's like a moment where I felt like that from people. Um... There was times where I felt that myself, like, oh, if I, like, if I speak up or if I do something that, like, focuses on this point of, of my life, I felt like people will be irritated about that. But from my experience, when those moments happen, um, it brings up a great discussion. I've been, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have, like, cast members who have been like super um, 
respectful. Some of them haven't, uh, don't understand fully like the black experience or haven't been around a lot of black people. So they have, so they have questions. So sometimes I have to direct them to like, where to find this information if I don't want to like share fully like, yeah, because not not my job to like teach people about the black experience, but like, I never had like someone come up to me and be like, or or behind my back. I never heard of anyone going like that. Dorsey is like a hard like he's really hard to work with because like every time we like joke or like pretend, it's like I never had that because all my all everyone I've worked with, majority of people I've worked with, have been very respectful. Um, and have wanted to know how how best to to learn and to grow. Yeah. Um, well, then maybe it's just because I'm a Sagittarius and a rising Aquarius, and I just want everybody to feel validated and loved. And that, like, I care. I'm the opposite of you, by the way. I'm an Aquarius <laughs> rising Sag. So we weird. We were meant. To Pisces be. moon. Yeah. Pisces moon. <laughs> Taurus moon. But still, still, we get. <laughs> Yeah, I um, but I'll share a quick experience and then get to my point with this question. But as far as I was um, involved in a show uh, where there were multiple directors for multiple different reasons. And we were doing a battle scene where someone suggested um, to the cast that they do a very stereotypical indigenous cry, war cry to make it seem more quote unquote savage. Um, to which I shut down really quickly and was like, that's not appropriate. Um, not only is it an incredibly harmful stereotype, but none of these people even are indigenous. So there's no reason for us to do this. And then later on in the process, I was walking past an off, they were, there were two people sitting in an office and I heard them talking about me and how I was too outspoken, how it's really not that big of a deal and how I was always the one to bring up contention. Mind you, I don't, like, again, like, I definitely feel the need of, like, well, then I don't care. Like, it's, I don't care if you have a beef. It does not matter to me. But I think the point that we're all, that, like, all three of you have summed up beautifully is that, like, yeah, like, if you want to, if you want to label us as hard to work with, you need to check your privilege and what you consider culture and what you consider to be standing up for themselves. Because if someone, if you, I don't know why touching my hair, maybe it's because it happened today, but then someone touched my hair, <laughs> and, and which we're in COVID, so I'm like six feet away, please. But this <laughs> came up and touched my hair in a Starbucks today. And um, really? Oh, absolute stranger. Absolute stranger just walked up and was like, I love your hair. And I immediately went, <laughs> and I, we're still touching the hair. We're still, we're still no, yeah. That. We're still touching the hair in the great city of Murray. We're still touching hair. So maybe that's just why it's fresh on my mind. But that when you turn around and you see why is she getting so offended about somebody touching her hair? Stop asking that question. Turn around and say, why? Sh why? Oh, it's probably like her need to have her own her own space and her the fact that she's black and a woman, the fact that she shouldn't have her own space, according to American society. Maybe that's why we shouldn't touch her hair. Like before you deem us as difficult to work with or hard to work with, check what our culture or what, you know, your culture says about two different things. And the difference between that might be is what is, I guess is what I'm getting at. Absolutely. I, I think if, you know, if theaters or directors or the uh, people that be want to blacklist creators for being hard to work with that's that says more about the theater company than um the actor absolutely yeah i think and anyone that's tuning in like i think as an actor you have to know your worth like if that were to happen what like really what why would you want to work with people that think that way and that treat you that way there's you know there's a million other problems you're going to deal with why deal with this one very true. Very, very true. Well, Shall do... yeah, yeah, what's up? I meant to bring this up earlier and I, it's not a talking point, but I just would love to get uh, other people's input. So I was, so I'm an educator as well. Um, and one of the things we're talking about is the inequity in uh, theater and education and what that looks like uh, on stage, you know, 
it's it's an expensive hobby that we do <laughs> between you know the fifty dollar voice lessons, dance lessons, acting training, and frankly, a lot of BIPOC members, you know, their their money needs to other places. How I guess my question is, what does the ideal look like for that? Because, you know, there's this old school of thought, well, these BIPOC actors can't be in these roles because they don't have the experience, but they don't have the experience because they've never been given the opportunity because they don't have the financial means to access it. So what does, I, I guess, financially, how does theater become accessible or what does that look like? Well, okay, this is something I'm very opinionated about. I need everybody, especially teachers, to stop with this narrative of like, well, I mean, like, she just hasn't progressed, as, especially when it comes to BIPOC and trans and other people who don't have the same access to these things you're talking about, like voice lessons, acting lessons, dance lessons, whatever else, and being like, we just don't have the time to teach them how to do all that. You are a teacher. You are a teacher. I need you to look at your rehearsal schedule and tell me when you are going to teach this <laughs> child how to do the best thing. And there was current, there was a school in New York like a few years ago who did Hunchback of Notre Dame and casted a white Esmeralda. And they got crucified because they casted a white woman as Esmeralda when that role is legendarily, which also is a whole other thing, legendarily belongs to the brown and black community now. It's just a thing and I'll meet when they get used to it. But that, like, stop saying, like, directors, if you're actually that good, and this is coming from another director, directors, if you're actually worth your salt, work with that actor. Whatever you need to fit into a contract, whatever you need to make work, work. Stop using that excuse. If you call yourself woke and say you're an ally to the BIPOC community, stop, stop using that excuse of, like, well, I just don't think, like, understand how the American society works and move forward. That's all I'm going to say. Somebody else talk. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'm going to talk to the people that, like, are like us. Um, just the idea of, like, you know, who grow up in these neighborhoods where, like, maybe that dance studio or that that film studio or whatever, the, the theater is, like, in the, another neighborhood. Or, like, those classes are too expensive. Mom can't afford it. Um, and say you are worth it. You have a story to tell. Like your, your background is your, is your, is your talent. That, how you grew up, your friends you grew up with, everything like that, that it's gonna, it's gonna propel you. You, you have a narrative that a character is going to like explode off the stage, off the screen, because you are who you are. Whether it's like you playing on the playground with your friends, whether you're playing video games, whether you're you're in your home writing something, those experiences, those moments are that those classes. You need to understand like there are like those professional classes, sure, and they're I'm sure they're great. I've never been a part of them. Um, but they are you are experience your life, experience your imagination, your if you're spiritual god propelling you through like your growth and your, your everything like that or the universe guiding you through life that is your classroom everything about it is propelling you to be that character in a show eventually i don't know maybe maybe i'm like a <laughs> off balance on that but that's how i feel i feel like no i agree i agree with that um, I agree with that, and also, uh, if you want something, like, bad enough, like, I think, again, the universe, whatever, like, will help you get to that, so if you're like, oh, I, I can't dance, or whatever, like, I feel like, if you really want to, like, there's so many dance calls that I should have not made the show, but I did, so, like, I believe in you, you can do it. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> bring that up, Alec, let's look at the oh. mic. Thank you for letting me hijack the question. No, not at all. No hijacking here. Does anybody else have any other things you want to bring up, talk about, some little Monday night tea? <laughs> Something that, I mean, Shelby, you help me out with this, and then I'll, I'll shout out, you know, Ben Hopkins. Uh, when I'm just starting, like, I've, I've been acting for, like, three years, and one of the things that, when I came to Utah, was, like, being cast in these roles, 
because I felt like they wanted a black actor. I wanted to be like, I wanted my talent to speak for itself. Uh, I didn't want to be like, oh yeah, they got me because like, they couldn't find anyone else or they wanted to check the box. Um, and I remember Shelby like said something like super like, got my ego going. I was like, yeah, she's like, what would you say? Be like, you know, get the roles now, and then if they really want you, they'll pay for it. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and then Ben Hopkins just like blew it out of the park for me. He was like, you know, I don't think it matters. I think there's been a history in the industry of people of color not getting roles because they were black or because of the way the, the audience might perceive them. Uh, and you're getting a chance to change the narrative, to, to be a part of that um, change. So, you know, take it. Uh, I just like, that changed my whole you know, idea. I'm not sure if you guys ever felt that way before, but I remember being like really scared to go into the auditions and be like, ah, you know, if I get this role, is it because of this? Um, but now I just like, you know, it doesn't matter because I'm going to tell my story and the story of my community through this character. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Alex. Oh, I was just going to say, absolutely. Um, same experiences where, you know, growing up it was, is, did I get this because I'm Black or is it because I'm talented? And, you know, the older I get, it's, no, I'm damn talented. I've earned this. And to all of the allies out there, or allies, um, check yourself. If you ever find yourself saying or thinking this person got this role because of race, that, that's not allyship. That is you projecting and it more often than not is a talent thing. Yeah, agreed. And to kind of just try and talk quick, just to go back to the conversation that Dorsey was just saying that I had is that Dorsey, um, shortly after I get finished at UVU, um, at their theater program, Dorsey came to my house and we talked about how to succeed in the theater program at UVU because we, the two, when, when I was a senior in the program and Dorsey was, um, I think it was his first year, yeah. we were the only two black students in the entire program. And so I just sat him down and I just gave him some pointers. I was like, when you get it, when you get to class and they say, pull out a monologue that is this, 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 it's a, you don't don't feel like you have to pull out a black monologue pull out a shakespearean pull out a whatever you have no bounds but also like know that you're not going to do any main stage shows about black people so try and fit that in your education as well i'm just talking about having to filter your education to your experience because most colleges in utah don't know how to do that just yet they're still figuring out how that works which makes no sense to me but um yeah that was a conversation which we do in the black community all the time like you need to come over to my house i'm gonna tell you how to help how you can help yourself and we'll have dinner and talk and whatever and it was a very beautiful night that i got to talk to dorsey but i i agree actors out there actors directors hair and makeup designers whoever you might be in whatever facet if you feel like you're being taken advantage of because of your race bring it up i don't know go to human resources whatever and don't feel like you have to stay either you don't have to put up with that kind of treatment. I know we're all trying to fill our bank accounts and put food on our table, but you do not deserve that kind of treatment. You don't deserve to be a box that gets checked because you're the one ensemble member of color. You don't deserve that. You deserve so much better. Also, again, get paid. It's another thing I told Dorothy, <laughs> which was actually it was given to me by a different person. But by the time you get to your senior year of college, at the least, start getting paid for your work start getting paid for your work, especially if you have to use your blackness to relate or bring forth a character that is specifically that, get paid. Get paid. That's what I'm gonna say. Any other questions? Anyone wanna talk about anything else? No? We good? <laughs> I think we're good. I think we can call it. Um, again, Darcy, Erica, and Alec, thank you so much. This was so nice and I love all of your faces and this was wonderful and very soul fulfilling for me. So thank you. Any last minute comments y'all want to make any, you want to grab a microphone, say anything? No, y'all look at me like, shall we stop talking? So I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for tuning in. We have so many more panels to come. Um, our next panel will be women in theater, which, you know, kind of comes as like a, but women in theater. And we talk about like women, the majority of high school programs, theater programs in college are run by women, but we still have lots of things that we should make progress on and talk about. So join us next time for the next panel series. Um, but for this one, we're signing off. So thanks everybody. And we'll see you next time. Now I got myself into this. Now I'm going to end the recording. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>